Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. This is Crime Talk, and my name is Scott Reich. A quick preview of the docket today, and it is a big one. First, Kay and Larry Woodcock speak and thank the media after the hearing yesterday for Lori Vallow and Chad Day Bell. Barry Morphew's daughters speak. A suspect in the Orsolia Gall matter, perhaps? What can you say about the Johnny Depp and Miss Heard trial other than maybe they deserve each other? And maybe I have an unpopular opinion, but I'll let you know. Um, a verdict in the Dr. William Husel trial. A physician's assistant is accused of murder and stalking. The Crumley's bond reduction argument is rejected. Don't live stream the crime scene, ladies and gentlemen. How many times do we have to say this? And then finally, our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. All right, everyone, you know the drill. Please subscribe if you have not done so. Like the video, leave me a comment, and hit that bell so you receive those notifications of when we go live or put up new content. As a quick reminder, I want to thank everybody for joining us last night for our live presentation. We went a little long. We had a little bit of audio at the beginning, but we got it all worked out, and Frank is feeling 100% better today. So we're all good to go. And you can see it's much better quality when Frank is running the camera than when I'm doing it. Anyway, please remember that you can listen to us on your favorite podcasting app at any time, night or day, by searching Crime Talk with Scott Reich. And hey, while you're there, leave us a five-star review on Spotify. It's kind of your free way of supporting Crime Talk, and we'd greatly appreciate it. You know, who knows? Maybe they'd want to pick us up someday. All right, before we get to the docket, let's take a moment to hear a word from our sponsors, the people that support this channel. Like many Americans, we got a dog during the pandemic. My quarantine dog, Miss Winnie the Bulldog. Now, Miss Winnie has grown accustomed to being around us all the time. When we were leaving the house, Winnie would have extreme anxiety, so we decided to look for natural products to help with her anxiety. We looked for the highest quality CBD treats, and we were not satisfied, and neither was Winnie. So we created a high quality CBD product that absorbs faster and provides the required results faster. Baked in Colorado CBD treats and beverage enhancers are made with nanotechnology. The nanotechnology makes the CBD extraction more pure, also allows for Baked in Colorado products to work faster. Baked in Colorado products can help reduce your pet's anxiety, ease joint pain, and help with your dog's skin problems. Go to our online store and see what Baked in Colorado product is best for your dog. When you order at bakedincolorado.com, enter code WINNIE and receive 15% off your first order. We have a 30-day money-back guarantee. If your dog does not experience the desired results in 30 days, return the product and we will refund your money. No questions asked. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is Wednesday, April 20th, 2022. Let's open the docket. First, Kay and Larry Woodcock, they spoke to the media during a news conference just outside the Fremont County Courthouse yesterday following Lori Vallow Daybell's arraignment, uh, which took place on Tuesday afternoon. Now, Larry wanted to thank the media for the coverage of the case, and he broke down when he said he was saddened to hear J.J.'s name in court. For those of you who don't know, the Woodcocks are J.J.'s grandparents. So Larry said he was very happy at this stage in the proceedings and is relieved to finally have the case moving forward. Larry reminded everyone in the press conference that this is a trial about two innocent children and asked everyone to keep them in their prayers. Now, Kay broke down when she spoke about seeing Lori in the courtroom for the first time since 2020, saying, quote, I loved her. I trusted her with a life. Now, Kay and Larry said that they uh, wished Lori would have uh, just called them and asked for help. Now, Lori's trial is scheduled to commence on October 19th of this year. This is a significant date because that is the day that Tammy Daybell died back in 2019. Coincidence? I don't know. Anyway, all right, we're almost done with talking about Barry Morphew forever, unless there's something new that's breaking. Well, the daughters have spoken out after prosecutors dropped the murder charges against their father. 
And as we all know, Mr. Barry Morphew's trial was set to start in about a week down in Canyon City, Colorado, but the prosecutors admitted they didn't have enough evidence to secure a conviction. And the district attorney filed a motion to drop all charges just nine minutes before Tuesday's hearing was due to start, claiming that the investigators needed more time to search an area that had long been subject of interest in the hopes of finding Suzanne's body. Well, Barry's daughters, who have uh, stuck by his side for every court appearance, were seen hugging and crying in relief as the judge approved the dismissal of the charges. Now, Mallory uh, Morphew stated that uh, we miss our mom clearly and we know our dad didn't have anything to do with it. Macy added, we're happy that we can go on with our lives and take time to heal. We wish we'd been treated better. Now, Iris Itan, the lead defense attorney for Barry Morphew, obviously uh, was very happy and gave Barry Macy and Mallory hugs as they uh, hopped into a truck and drove away. She then stated these charges were false from the beginning. And Itan stated after Tuesday hearing that there's no physical evidence linking Barry Morphew to this case and noted that the prosecutors have never, have never, before said they needed to find Suzanne Morphew's body to prosecute this case. Well, that sounds like something I've said yesterday when it all broke. Really? Now all of a sudden you need a body? Hmm. No, they're trying to cover themselves because they got egg on the face. Well, Miss Iris Itan also said Barry and his daughters are relieved, but they want to know where Suzanne is as well. Barry Morphew loves Suzanne Morphew. He loves her and misses her and wants to know where she is. We'll leave it at that. All the people that think Mr. Morphew is guilty will let me know. And all the people that think that, well, justice was done because the prosecuting, prosecution could not prove their case will let me know as well. But hey, I think that's probably one of the last Barry Morphew reports. You're welcome. All right. Orsalia Gall. Remember her? The 51-year-old Queen's mother who is the subject of the uh, uh, murder investigation where she was allegedly stabbed some... Uh, 58 times and then stuffed into a hockey duffel bag and dumped about a half a mile away from their home. Well, apparently the police are now looking into multiple people of interest, do we dare say suspects, including an alleged handyman lover who had access to the home. Hmm. Handyman. I thought it was always the pool boy. What are you in? The handyman. Although police have not yet released a name of the person they're seeking, the workman is believed to have knowledge of Gall's home, including where she kept a spare key, particularly if he was that kind of handyman, huh? Hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> say no more, say no more. The handyman is also thought to have had a romantic relationship with Gall at some point. The romance apparently ended, but it isn't clear when the relationship did in fact end. And the New York Police Department detectives are zoning on multiple suspects that they say they believe Gall knew her killer. Investigators do not believe it was a planned murder given how sloppy the crime scene uh, was uh, basically left at the murder scene. Detectives noted that the killer didn't go to the house with someone to carry Gall's body, hence the reason they took the duffel bag from the house. Now the family's electrician, um, a guy by the name of Arhuno Jack revealed that the house was outfitted with an advanced camera surveillance system, and he felt pretty confident that it would have captured the killer on the video. Now, Jack also said the house has a separate door that leads up to the kitchen or down into the basement, which is outfitted with a laundry room, and that used to be the boys' playroom. The NYPD is offering, brace yourselves, a $3,500 reward for any information leading to an arrest in connection with the homicide. And they're leaving posters advertising the payout around her neighborhood. $3,500. That's all NYPD can come up with for information. Are you serious? Okay. I, I, I get it. All that COVID money is gone, I guess. And it's down to $3,500 for a gruesome murder in a upper middle class neighborhood. Come on, people. I think we can do a little better than that. All right. Next, Johnny Depp. Okay. Now, Johnny Depp, they just ended basically day two of uh, Mr. Depp's testimony in his defamation case against Amber Heard. Now, uh, 
Depp makes more claims about Heard, saying that she would drink excessively and do illicit drugs around him when he was trying to get sober. Depp also claims uh, Amber could and would knock back two bottles of wine a night, and he alleges he's also seen her take MDMA mushrooms and high velocity speed throughout the relationship. Now, Depp also claims she refused to attempt to go clean with him. Depp also made a shocking claim in court that Heard would threaten to kill herself when he tried bailing from their flights. Depp said that during their nasty blowouts, that, and he insists that Heard instigated, he would try to remove himself from the toxic situation, which would cause her to spiral out of control. Depp testified Heard would get security involved so that he could not leave. Depp also testified that she would be in hysterics while saying what he perceived to be as suicidal remarks. He also said that Heard would be on his front steps in the middle of the night, shouting at him from outside the home. Now, Depp opened up uh, on his testimony on Monday, saying that he never laid a hand on Heard or any woman and that he was in court to seek the truth, no matter what. Now, in today's testimony, Depp told the court about a fight that he and Heard had back in 2014 in Australia, where the top of his finger was severed after Heard allegedly threw a bottle of vodka at him. Heard claims that he chopped his own finger off. Depp testified that Heard was angry with him after he met with his lawyers to discuss a possible post-nuptial agreement. He also said he remembered Miss Heard taking his cigarette from his ashtray and stubbing it out on his face. There was also a audio recording released today of Miss Heard admitting that she would get physical with Johnny Depp. Kind of goes against her whole argument that she's the complete victim in the case and that she is some sort of ambassador for domestic violence. Well, it's a little tough to go with when you're maybe the instigator as well. Needless to say, uh, this case, if I was a jury, I would give them each zero dollars. Um, find that they are both crazy and give them nothing. Um, they deserve each other, no doubt. And we have an audio recording between Heard and Depp We've had it up for a couple of years now, I think. And at that time, my first thought was these people deserve each other. Some people say Depp's doing great on the stand. His mannerisms, the way he speaks, just I find absolutely a terrible delivery when it comes to the jury. He cannot answer a question. He's uncertain about his own answers that he wants the jury to be certain about. He can't remember lots of things. It's like we're sitting around the the table, uh, him trying to remember his opioid stupors that he was in, and he has no good memory of it. So how the hell do you expect the jury to know what happened when you can't even remember what happened? I don't know what to do with this. Now everybody's looking at it. This trial is supposed to go for weeks. I don't know. Everybody's entitled to go to court, but what a mess. Let me know what you think in the comments. I don't know what I would do with these two other than say they deserve each other, which I think that their therapist basically said each of them could dish it out and receive it uh, just like each other. All right, the trial of Dr. William Husel. That's right, the former Ohio doctor who was acquitted of murder after he was accused of causing the death of 14 critically ill patients by ordering large doses of fentanyl. Dr. Husel faced one count of murder for each patient and was found not guilty on all counts. Now, jurors deliberated over seven days in a trial that lasted about two months. The trial was one of the biggest cases of its kind against a healthcare professional in the United States, trying, tying together themes of medical treatment and ethics and what amount of opioid is suitable for end-of-life comfort care. While jurors had to weigh whether Husel was acting as permitted under Ohio law when prosecutors say he ordered 10 times the amount of fentanyl that expert witnesses testified to was the norm in non-surgical settings, and most of the ICU patients who received 1,000 micrograms of fentanyl were in their 70s and 80s needing help breathing on ventilators, although a few were as young as their late 30s. Now, the patients who Husel treated from 2015 to 2018 were rushed to the Mount Carmel Health System in Columbus, Ohio area with a variety of ailments, including cancer, pneumonia, and organ failure. 
Prosecutors called more than 50 witnesses, including medical experts, family members of the patients who died, and Husel's former colleagues. Husel's defense team, led by Jose Baez, I'm telling you, this guy is good. Well, he successfully argued that no maximum doses of fentanyl are considered illegal under state law and that his client was trying to give comfort and care to people who are dying or near death. Husel, who did not testify, has not spoken publicly or given media interviews since the allegations arose back in 2019. Boy, he didn't speak to anybody, didn't test at his trial, and he was found not guilty. Isn't that amazing? Funny how that works, isn't it? Now, Mr. Baez told reporters that he was saddened um, that Husel was charged in the first place, and he took the case because of a belief that doctors have a right to care for their patients accordingly. Now, in the wake of the allegations, Husel in 2019 and Mount Carmel CEO stepped down after he said the hospital made meaningful changes throughout the system and it fired almost two dozen employees, including nurses, physicians, and members of the pharmacy management team. And of course, 35 families filed wrongful death lawsuits against Husel, the hospital, and several staff members and many of the families have settled for a total of about $13.5 million. And do you really want to get into what is a person who is in their 70s or 80s dying of or organ failure uh, life is worth? Well, if you asked an insurance company, it wouldn't be much, but apparently for some bad press, they paid a lot more. All right, keeping with the physician theme today, how about a physician's assistant in Virginia? Well, this physician's assistant uh, from Virginia is accused of stalking his ex-girlfriend for three days at her home and place of work. Well, what did he do next? That's right. He's accused of murdering her husband, Jacob Klein. Uh, he was arrested in Virginia on Friday and is now in federal custody. He's expected to be extradited to New York to face charges of second degree murder. Now, Klein is accused of murdering 35-year-old Philip Rabati, who was married to Klein's ex-girlfriend, Elena Raiden. Now, cops say that Rabati was found bound with multiple stab wounds and mutilation to his body at his home in New Scotland, New York, near the state capital of Albany. Now, Klein is believed to have stalked his ex in the three days prior to the attack, unbeknownst to her. Now, using data and video from license plate readers, doorbell video cameras, and other electronic devices, including cell phone data, investigators were able to piece together a timeline of Klein's activity before and after the murder. All this data shows how Klein had visited the couple's home in the days prior to the alleged murder. Klein drove from Franklin County, Virginia, up to Albany, New York, where he rented a car from an enterprise and allegedly stalked out the victim's home and hospital where both Rabati and his wife worked. On Wednesday morning, after his ex had already left for work, Klein walked up to the door of the couple's home where Rabati opened it. Surveillance camera footage shows Rabati appearing to react as if a weapon was brandished. After the alleged murder, Klein returned his rental vehicle and then drove out of New York uh, back to Virginia. Police tracked Klein's mobile phone and troopers stopped him at the Virginia-Tennessee border. Now, after staying in his car for several minutes and refusing to follow orders, Klein eventually sat for several more minutes before surrendering to the police without incident. A gun was found in the car that Klein was driving. Now, when he was arrested, they cannot tell if it was his weapon or somebody else's or if it was stolen, but they're still tracing that weapon. All right, next on the docket, the Crumleys. Well, an Oakland County Circuit Court judge by the name of Cheryl A. Matthews refused to lower the bail, which was previously set for James Crumley and Jennifer Crumley. That's right, the parents of the alleged Oxford, Michigan high school shooter, Ethan Crumley. The judge stated that while a lower district court judge found probable cause to move forward with the case against the parents, she believed the probability of a conviction in this matter is too difficult to gauge or to predict. That's right, Judge, because it is such an unprecedented, first time ever prosecuted theory of prosecution. Of course it's hard to predict. It shouldn't have been filed. Anyway, 
The judge said that the seriousness of the matter and the defendant's lack of ties to Michigan were among the reasons the couple should not be given an easier chance to get out of jail before trial. The judge also noted that the Crumleys have family in Florida and that they were on the run before they were arrested near the downtown Detroit. All the more reason why the couple could pose a flight risk. The bail stays, remains at $500,000 for each of the two parents. That trial date is scheduled for October 24th, 2022. Now, the defense said it anticipated the writing of at least 10 separate motions before the trial date. One, the defense said would be a motion for a change of venue. The defense said it would work on the motions in turn so as not to deluge the court with 10 documents at once. Prosecutors say they wanted a speedy trial in this matter. Well, they, of course they do. Well, it's still a terrible thing in everybody's minds. And you certainly don't want cooler heads to prevail. And don't get me wrong, the Crumleys are not parents of the year. In fact, they sound like complete derelicts. Well, they sound like they were not the most caring parents around, allegedly. Okay? But you can't charge a parent for everything that the kid does if the parents didn't know about it. And I know people are going to say they sent text messages back and forth. Yes, after the shooting took place. Okay, that is not beforehand helping somebody plan it. I get it when motions are high. Well, that's what appellate courts are for to look at things. Okay, think about it, ladies and gentlemen. You really want that to be the standard? You're a bad parent, and I know a lot of people think they're great parents, but they got some really crummy kids, and guess what? They do things. Maybe we should just charge the parents for everything that somebody does, and guess what? Maybe we should extend it beyond the age of 18. Maybe if they live in your basement, who knows? Maybe even longer because you're their parent. You should know exactly what they're doing and thinking at all times. That's ridiculous, right? Well, sometimes you have to demonstrate absurdity with absurdity, ladies and gentlemen, and that's where it's headed if the Crumleys are found guilty under the law. Anyway, let's move on. Okay, what have we said? Don't live stream the crime scene, right? Well, guess what? Somebody obviously has not been watching Crime Talk. So a man choked, beat, and allegedly stabbed a woman to death on Facebook Live. This is all according to the Baton Rouge, Louisiana Police Department. And the suspect, the guy by the name of Earl Lee Johnson Jr., faces a count of first-degree murder for allegedly killing Janice David of Baton Rouge as well. Now, officers arrested Earl Lee Johnson, 35, yesterday evening around 5.25 p.m. prior to being aware of his involvement in David's murder. Johnson was initially arrested for stealing a vehicle. David was found deceased in the vehicle around 10 p.m. that night, and police think that Johnson and David used drugs heavily over several days before the homicide. Oh, I'm so surprised. I'm shocked. I cannot believe that they were engaging in this lifestyle and somebody died. Oh, I'm so shocked. Anyway, someone reportedly saw the video of the attack from Facebook Live and told Facebook. The company then told Louisiana State Police. The police spokesman um, called the alleged murder a very gruesome, very evil act in which Johnson choked, beat, and stabbed Miss David, allegedly. He then tried to set the car on fire, allegedly. And, well, the autopsy is pending, but my guess is she died of those stab wounds and probably smoke inhalation if she wasn't already deceased. <sighs> the world we live in, ladies and gentlemen. Well, at least we have this to laugh about, our dumb criminal of the day. Two Alabama men have been arrested for allegedly trying to steal a speed warning trailer that belonged to the Russell County Sheriff's Office. Now, police presume Gabriel Mendoza Garcia and Steve Jerome Spann were trying to steal the trailer for the batteries, which are going for top dollar these days. Well, the sheriff says that the suspects were tracked down through the trailer's GPS. God, could you imagine putting those little speed signs up and having a GPS device on it so you knew exactly where it was? My gosh, they put that GPS on things everywhere these days. It's like it's so small, the technology, it could practically fit anywhere. And apparently it can. Well, the trailer is also equipped with a camera, which captured video of the theft. Now, it just shows you you've got crazy people running around, according to the sheriff. Both men were charged with first-degree theft and property and first-degree criminal mischief. And you two gentlemen, the bottom line is, listen, cameras are everywhere. GPS, 
GPS is everywhere. Not only did they find you by going to the trailer where they could find you with the GPS, they then pulled the video to show you stealing the trailer. How dumb is that? I got an idea. Why don't you just assume it's all being videotaped and don't take other people's things because that's stupid and you're going to get caught and then you're going to go to jail. And I know your mother told you, you don't touch other people's things unless you have permission to do so. All right. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Crime Talk.